Hey everybody, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I am here because I wanted to give you all an update about what was going on in Israel and Gaza. And we're very, very lucky to have someone joining me who has extensive knowledge of the region. I've known him since I was in my 20s uh, and he is um, former head of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's now the President Emeritus of the Council of Foreign Relations. Hi, everyone. Um, anyway, Richard Haas is a good friend of mine. He's also one of the smartest people I know about foreign policy and particularly about the Middle East, although his expertise is not limited to that region. And um, if you all have any questions for Richard, I was saying your praises, Richard, about um, how much you know about this region and how what an important voice you have. I think when I met you, you were, gosh, a national assistant national. What were you? A, a na you were in the National Security Council, and you're you were in charge of the Middle East, I believe. What was your title back then? You've had so many in the years since, but when we first met many years ago, that yeah, was your was title. The, uh, what was your title? It was special assistant to the president for national security affairs, and I I was overseeing. This was when George Bush, the father, was president. So this was around 89, if I remember correctly. You were a, a young reporter at the local NBC affiliate in Washington. We, we don't have to tell the rest of how I met well, you at a grocery store and tried to go, set you up with but, my uh, friends. But we've not gone there. Uh, but yeah, I, was, uh, I was in charge of uh, the Middle East and the Persian Gulf and also the India, Pakistan, Afghanistan area at the on the National Security Council staff back when Papa Bush was president and Brent Scowcroft was my boss. And you have held many positions, as I mentioned before you hopped on, that you were head of the Council on Foreign Relations, many things between that and the CFR, and now you're the head, what the president emeritus. And anyway, Richard is really smart, everybody. He knows well, we'll he's see. talking you're about You're setting me up for failure. <laughs> Also, he has a news newsletter, you guys, that comes out on Friday called Home and Away. It's free. It's about international and domestic policy. And honestly, I'm going to sign up for it as soon as we're done with this conversation because there's no uh, smarter person, as I said, than Richard. Richard, before we talk about this whole mess and this unbelievably weak, uh, unbelievable week that's happened, I want to start by asking you about the latest news. I sent you a video that Hamas had released of a young woman named Mia Shem. I happened to interview her mother, Karen. Mia is 21 years old, I believe. She might be 19, but she's very young. She was part of that music festival. Her mother didn't know her whereabouts. All she knew is a friend had said she was shot in the arm. Hamas released a video just, you know, hours ago, I guess, of Mia uh, being, I guess, administered to, and her arm was, I guess, in some kind of bandaging, saying that she was being taken care of and given medication, but she just wanted to go home. Now, the IDF um, also released a statement following that, saying uh, a video of Mia Shem was released by Hamas. She says she's being taken care of, has medicine, and just wants to go home. Sorry, that's what she said. The IDF statement said, last week, Mia was abducted by Hamas, IDF officials have since informed me as family we, and are in continuous contact with them. In the video published by Hamas, they try to portray themselves as humane. However, they are a horrific terrorist organization responsible for the murder and abduction of babies, children, men and women, and the elderly. At this time, we are deploying all intelligence and operational measure, measures for the return of all hostages, including Mia. I just wanted you to kind of get into the head of Hamas and tell us, A, why you think that this video was released, and um, is it a positive development, at least for the families in Israel worried sick about their loved okay, ones? The only thing that's good about it is this young woman is still alive. And the fact that they've made a video uh, about her, it seems to me that that probably increases her chances to stay alive. And I think it's possible at some point you could have some kind of an exchange where uh, some of the hostages are released, possibly for Hamas prisoners in Israeli uh, Israeli jails. But they are they are using this. Let's just be blatant. She was at this music festival. Some 200 other individuals got killed at this uh, music.
Yeah. In cold blood. In Richard. cold blood. Uh, that's the pure definition of terrorism. These are innocents. These are civilians. And I think Hamas is probably worried by the uh, international reaction, maybe hoping if it somehow appears to be acting responsibly, that might increase pressure on Israel not to act militarily. It, it might increase support in certain quarters for, uh, for Hamas. But there, I mean, how do I put this? This young woman, and my heart goes out to her, uh, but she is, she in a sense is being used by Hamas for their purposes. Uh, but we shouldn't take this as somehow that they've changed their stripes. We know, we know what this, uh, you know, what this leopard is. And where do you think, I mean, I know it's hard to say, Richard, but where do you think they are keeping these hostages? And the thing that I think about as these Israeli missile strikes hit these areas, uh, how safe they are because Hamas is known for using civilians and innocents as human shields. Their headquarters yeah, that's, are right that's under a hospital, standard operating apparently. procedure that Hamas puts civilians or prisoners in places of great risk. And what they're hoping is that there's a, that deters the Israelis or whomever from attacking. And so, and what the idea is that, again, they're using them as human shields, essentially. It's, it's, it's no, no more, no less. Where exactly uh, that kind of granular intel intelligence is hard to get. My guess is they're moving these people around with uh, quite frequently. They're keeping them headed. These are, these are assets. Let's just, again, I don't mean to be harsh here, but these are assets for Hamas, either to be traded or, again, to be used to deter Israeli action. If Israel at some point gets granular intelligence about where some of these people are, uh, whether they're Israeli citizens or others, that opens up the possibility, the possibility of some type of a rescue attempt. But I don't want to underestimate how difficult it is first to get the intelligence and then to actually carry out an operation. You can imagine how difficult it is to act with surprise, to avoid a gunfight. It's possible, but it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to mount these uh, with confidence they'll work. Well, let's let's go back a couple of days. All right. Israel warns the citizens of Gaza in, in what, by all measures, Richard, is an unrealistic request. Right. Asking a million people to go from the north to the south um, and to move everything as they're trying to, to traverse roads that have been blown up, making it really difficult for all these families with children. The images we've seen have been pretty heartbreaking I and mean, it's hard, you know, you don't want to compete with heartbreaking images, but everything has been just uh, unbelievable to witness. And, and we can talk about the Israeli massacre in a moment, but what, you know, is Israel, which by the way, warns civilians, they put bombs that, that make a loud noise to get people out of their buildings. They, they're trying to do this, but, I mean, what is, I mean, I guess, A, was that an unrealistic request? As you watched all these people in Gaza try to, to move, what well, did you Gaza make of that, Gaza is one of the Richard? more densely populated pieces of territory on the planet Earth. The Israelis are clearly preparing for some type of military action, Katie. None of us knows exactly what the scale is, what's the mix of air forces, missiles and ground forces. Uh, they obviously, though, would prefer the area uh, be less populated by civilians. That would free them up to some extent in their use of munitions. So I think that's what it's about. They want to, uh, they have no desire to kill uh, innocents. That's not their intent here. It would, however, be to some extent the, the byproduct if they have to do, if they choose to do large scale military actions. So it's clear to me they, they want to get people out of, um, in particular, the north of Gaza. It, my guess is, and I've heard reports of this, I'm not on the ground, obviously, Hamas will try to uh, make it hard for people to leave. For the same reason the Israelis want people out, they want to have a more open space where essentially they can isolate her Hamas personnel. Uh, Hamas is not going to want to give them that opportunity. Well, Hamas. I think for them, a victory is more civilian deaths to hold against Israel, right? I mean, they would, 
they would, they're, they're proponents of allowing their citizens to die at the hands There's of the Israeli There's nothing in military, their history correct? that would be uh, consistent with what you just said. <laughs> Hamas is a, look, it's a terrorist organization. I, it, in this case, it killed Israelis uh, wholesale, civilians. Uh, a lot of it, it seems to me, just also out to kill Jews, regardless of, of their 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 uh, citizenship. If Hamas cared about the people of Gaza, they would have a positive agenda. They would uh, they would be looking for ways to improve the lot of uh, the people of uh, uh, of Gaza. They would be looking, I think, to to I would argue to coexist with Israel and ultimately have something where they could focus not on war but on the quality of life and peace. There's zero about that. They've had that opportunity for decades. They haven't availed themselves of it. So we shouldn't kid ourselves. Uh, we know who they are. They have revealed themselves time and time again. And their concern for the, the people of Gaza, shall we say, is tertiary at best. Well, I mean, their, their charter calls for the utter destruction of Israel, the, the complete destruction of Israel, correct, Richard? And the way they treat their citizens in terms of women, LGBTQ rights, any kind of human rights internally in Gaza is 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 deplorable. So I'm actually Their surprised the war is not made about that. The way they govern, the intolerance, and so forth. So it's not simply their, if you will, their foreign policy objectives. They're not interested in a two-state solution, by the way. They're not interested in peaceful coexistence with Israel, whatever the territorial distribution. They want the elimination of the the Jewish state. Straightforward. So the, it's the reason that it's not simply because of the terrorism that we've seen again in, a week ago, but their charter, their, their essence, their DNA. Gaza is not and will not be a candidate for participation in a political process. It's getting ahead of ourselves in the, pop, in the conversation here. But one of the challenges for Israel and the United States is saying, look, Gaza is not a potential political participant. We need to find one. We need to encourage the emergence of a Palestinian leadership that's willing to live in peace with us, that's willing to have uh, essentially coexist with us. We have to work out the terms. It'll be a difficult and long negotiation. But what, the one thing we do know, that is not Hamas. Well, uh, if you're just joining us, I'm talking to Richard Haas, the former president of the Council on Foreign Relations and an expert on the Mideast. Um, Getting you know, for life. Here. Sorry. I mean, I mean, oh, that's it's getting dark. Okay, don't worry. Um, but you know, I want to I want to talk to you about um, Israel's response because you just wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs, Richard, and the title of it. Well, it was about what friends. Friend? Hold on two seconds. I wrote it down. Um, I read it. La I read it last night. It's called What Why Friends don't you tell Me friends. About It. And it's the question of what should the United States do vis-a-vis -vis Israel now? I thought the president's speech the other day, President Biden's speech, was the most powerful speech of his presidency. And his instinctive reaction of having Israel's back, as he put it, I, is exactly right. And saying that Israel has the right to respond. Indeed, it's essential that Israel respond, that terrorism not exist unanswered. But that opens up a, a lot of really interesting, difficult questions. Uh, just because you have the right to respond, it doesn't make clear exactly what that response ought to be. How do you respond? And my view is that the United States ought to be urging Israel not to respond wholesale with a massive invasion and a prolonged occupation. I worry about the effects of that, Katie. I worry about not simply the civilians who will get killed. I worry about the, the casualties on the Israeli uh, side. I think Israel will lose some of the high ground internationally if they do that. I also think it leads to war widening. That is a scenario where I believe in, increases the odds that Hezbollah, based in Lebanon, could get into the uh, act, and they have far more military capability. They have like, like 150,000 right, And they could reach Tel Aviv and right, shut Richard? down Ben-Gurion Airport. So they have an enormous uh, capability. So I want to, I want to avoid Arsenal, that kind yeah. of scenario where a bad situation uh, somehow manages to to get a lot worse. It could bring the United States and Iran into the uh, into the uh, equation. And even if Israel were to go in, and imagine uh, I'm wrong, and they could actually 
succeed. I'm, I'm skeptical they could quote unquote root out or eliminate Hamas. I think the nature of Hamas makes it very difficult, really impossible to do that. I think the whole effort would also generate new recruits to, to, to Hamas. I think that would happen. But even if I'm wrong here, which is obviously possible, what do they do the day after? How do you then get out? How do you leave Gaza as a political entity? Who would govern it? And how do you avoid the, I think, likelihood that Hamas or a Hamas-like organization would fill the vacuum? So I just don't see the place for a large military operation. What I've suggested really are two things, Katie. One is Israel keep doing what it's doing. When it gets intelligence, where Hamas leaders are, for example, or Hamas uh, individual fighters are, go take them out, whether it's with cruise missiles or, or special forces or whatever. And then secondly, Israel has to rebuild its defenses inside Israel. This never should have happened. Hamas should should never have been so militarily successful against against Israel in, in doing this. So Israel has to rebuild defense uh, in southern and western Israel. So Hamas, even if it wanted to try something like this again, could not succeed. They never should have been allowed to get to accomplish what they accomplished. I want to, gosh, there's so much to pick apart there, Richard, but how did they how was, I mean, this has been the question asked, I think, since day one. How, why was there such a huge intelligence failure on the part of the So let me get Israeli a little bit wonky military. here, which you know uh, you expect from me. Uh, and I think you have to break it down into intelligence failure and defense failure. Uh, there were probably two intelligence failures. One is Israel was not collecting as much information as they could or should have about Gaza. It probably wasn't a priority. That, uh, that it should have been. They didn't take the threat that seriously. They, they were yes, really exactly. focused on the West focused Bank. much more right, on the Richard? West Bank and on Iran. Those are their two uh, priorities. Second of all, to the extent they had data, my guess is they didn't take it seriously. So much about of intelligence, if you think about before Pearl Harbor, we had information, we dismissed it. Before the 1973 war, Israel had information, they dismissed it. Uh, before 9-11, we had information here in the United States. It was dismissed. My guess is that there was a mindset in Israel not to take whatever intelligence they did have in hand seriously, not to give it much credibility. And then lastly, I was suggesting their defense posture was really, was really weak. Many troops apparently were not on duty. The readiness levels were low. It appears that troops may have been shifted to the West Bank to protect settlers. I can't prove that, but I've heard reports of that. All I can say for sure, Katie, is this was an intelligence and defense failure of the first order, and this will be the subject of all sorts of commissions and inquiries in Israel. We will one day, I believe, learn most of what happened and why, and individuals will be held uh, accountable. But I don't. I I, I, w I think it's clear that this was again uh, both uh, an intelligence and a military failure. Apparently, from what I read over the weekend, Richard, there were also like Hamas had kind of bamboozled them to thinking that they were sort yeah. of working with them, or that had shown I don't know how to put this, maybe some flexibility or some softening in their stance, which I think was you know they was which was a total it could have been there could have been, been that the term. hamas was appearing on the surface to be somewhat practical or reasonable to lull the israelis into a kind of complacency and complacency is the word that comes to mind when i i look at all this it's also conceivable i don't know maybe israeli intelligence does katie whether there were elements within hamas that were doing different things there could have been political leaders or some who were working with Israel because they were responsible for the quality of life there as opposed to people preparing a military operation. I don't rule that out. I just don't know what I don't know here. Uh, so your, your suggestion in your piece is that President Biden should, in essence, tell Netanyahu to tap the brakes a bit, to show restraint. And in fact, some of the language that he's used today shows a little of that creeping in. He must have read your piece, Richard. Or people are advising him to say, hey, you know, let's think of the, you know, the repercussions of this massive military, um, you know, uh, invasion, ground forces, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I guess, first of all, A, do you think he is going to do that? 
he, they're, they're now thinking of, I guess there's consideration of going to Israel. Tony Blank, Blanket is back. But um, what do you think are the chances and how delicate and difficult is it for Biden to, uh, President Biden to inject himself? This is really this? threading a needle, Katie. Uh, he wants to be as supportive as Israel as he can. What Israel suffered was traumatic, doesn't even begin to capture it for a society, for, for Jews who went through the Holocaust to experience something like this. It also was a great shock for Israelis. They thought that the state of uh, Israel was, would never allow something like this to, uh, to, to happen. So the president wants to be supportive. But yes, he also wants to advise Israel not to do things that he believes would be counterproductive. It reminds me a little bit of the post 9-11 conversation here. We were collectively traumatized. There was a tremendous impulse, to, not just impulse, to strike back. But there was a foreign policy need to. You want to show terrorists that they cannot act with impunity. You want to hit back at them. So they're, they're weaker. So right. how to get that balance right? And that's why, again, I think he will end up arguing something not inconsistent with what I've suggested, which is act, but be, go after Hamas more than going after Gaza, almost trying to, distor to discern a distinction between the two. Build up your defenses so something like this doesn't happen again. Try to reduce the possibility or the causality of what might lead to an, a second front. Because I think the odds go up that Hezbollah would be tempted to get involved if there is a large-scale military operation in, in, in Gaza. And then I think the president will hold off for now. But at some point, I think it's a pretty good chance that if and when the dust settles, then you'll have a real heart to heart between him and Bibi Netanyahu or who's ever prime minister then about what we used to call the peace process, saying there's got you can't beat something with nothing. If we don't want Hamas to be the voice and face of Palestinians, we not only have to defeat them militarily, but we have to open up a political path to those who are willing to get rid of violence and live in peace with Israel. The day will come for that. It's too soon now, but that day will also come. I think for now, though, the focus will be on limiting whatever Israel does in, in, in Gaza and urging them to rebuild their defenses. But a full-out assault will only harden animosity and hatred towards Israel. And, you know, and, and, and there's no guarantee I mean, my understanding is that, that Hamas will even be eradicated. And if it is, Richard, isn't there a chance it can just reconstitute in another form? I mean, we're, we're dealing with an ideology as much as a, as a military or, or a I agree with you 100%. organization. Uh, I don't like the phrase eradicated or whatever, rooted out. It, 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 it suggests a degree of 100% success. It's not on. That's not the nature of the entity. As you say, it's an ideology, it's a network, it's an organ, it's an, yes, it's an organization, but it's not static. Uh, it can recruit. And what worries me is that the process of this will generate new recruits. And then again, even if you're seemingly successful, it won't last. Because uh, kind of radicalism won't right. go away. If anything, it might even be, be hard. And that's, by the way, what happened after the Israelis left in 2005? It didn't solve the problem. Uh, radicalism didn't go away. So it's very hard to translate military defeats into lasting political outcomes. We've learned that the hard way in recent years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Israel had learned that in Lebanon and, and Gaza. I don't, you know, I think what the president's going to, going to want to do is to gently, gently, push Israel in the direction to basically try to avoid that, that possible outcome here. How, how difficult though, you know, you're, you're advocating a more strategic approach, Richard, but given that, you know, that how, how do, where, I guess the question is, where are these people? Where is Hamas? Where, it's not like they yeah. have a central location or a headquarters. I mean, they're in these underground tunnels. They're everywhere. As I said earlier, they're in, uh, you know, scattered amongst civilian populations. Um, even with a strategic um, approach, 
how can they really be not eradicated, but they I can be degraded. I think that's numbers. already taking place where the Israelis know very well who their principal military leaders are. They probably have a pretty good organizational chart. Aren't they? No, the like political the leaders are Richard? some of them, not the military leaders. They're on the ground. The fighters or the terrorists are on the ground. So my my and the Israelis are already beginning to do that. This is a kind of a, a gradual campaign. It requires really specific intelligence. What to use the awful term of art, actionable intelligence that's specific enough and time sensitive enough that you can then do something based on it. I think that's that's already unfolding. That's already happening. That will continue. And I think the question at some point the Israelis will add a ground component to it. They'll send in special forces or troops. The real issue, you know, commandos, the real issue is whether they go in with a really large presence to control all the territory. That's what I have doubts about, but I think that will be the big debate. Uh, so it's not a question of whether they act, and again, they should act. The question is exactly the scale of it and the nature of it. So Hamas has been in power, Richard, since oh, no. 2007. They've been formally the government um, after they, they won the election, but Hamas has been present in significant ways for several decades before that, too. So elected, sorry, you know, elected to, to run the country in 2007. There haven't been any elections since then. How do, you know, and you alluded to this earlier in our conversation, but how do you find something that, that is able to replace Hamas. The Palestinian Authority, right, it, that's the West Bank, is apparently really corrupt and, and not very effective. And that's why Hamas, I guess, took over in you're, Gaza. You're I'm exactly trying right. to learn I mean, all this stuff. Hamas um, gained popularity because they were seen as having energy. They weren't corrupt. They were disciplined. The Palestinian Authority was old, corrupt, hadn't delivered. So people were willing to... Uh, bet on something new. And initially, wasn't Hamas kind of good to the Palestinian people in Gaza? I mean, weren't they sort of kind of trying to to win their support um, with aid and good stuff? Good is not the word I use. There were some social benefits, some medical treatment. They were more organized. Uh, but, you know, but again, over time, we've seen both the intolerance as well as the violence. Look, I think the only way to do it, if I were to think of, would probably be gradually and in phases. And Hamas would have to be re degraded, reduced militarily. I think then Israel would have to articulate a bunch of principles about uh, a Palestinian political future. And it would probably have to happen first on the West Bank. That is uh, the traditional heart of the Palestinian population. And if there ever were to be a Palestinian state, and that would have to be a part of the deal, the core of it would be in the, what we call the, the West Bank. And, and ultimately, that would have to become something of an example. I would say a West Bank first project. But if it showed that it could happen there and it was working well, then I think that changes the conversation in Gaza. And whether ultimately you would have two Palestinian states, which some have talked about, or it'd be one state uh, with or without a physical connection, that's so far down the track that we don't have to have that conversation. But I think the, what would be critical here would be demonstrating that Israel is willing to hold out a, a serious, viable, attractive political path. It wouldn't give the Palestinians everything they want, but it would give them more than they have now and more than a violent Hamas could ever bring to them. What, I, what, I'm, what I'm drawing on here, Katie, at the risk of confusing it even more, is my experience in Northern Ireland where I I was going to say, I think you were going to talk about Northern Ireland. Explain yeah. how that could be. I was be the U.S. negotiator there for three years. I then went later on as an international mediator. And what the British did in the 90s, after decades and decades of urban terrorism, is they basically had a two-track policy. One is they basically really cracked down and showed the, the terrorists, in this case the provisional IRA, they would not be able to shoot their way to power. But they opened up a serious political track and they said, if you give up violence, ultimately, if you give up your guns, you can have a Northern Ireland that won't give you everything you want. You won't have a United Ireland right uh, anytime soon, but you can have a, a much better life, a much better society, a say in the political process, a say in your political future. And it ultimately worked. 
and George Mitchell uh, played a critical role in negotiating this, what was called the Belfast, a Good Friday Agreement. It was 25 years ago that it was reached. But those two tracks, very tough militarily security, but a very active, legitimate, real, attractive political track, that to me is what did it. And but you I agree, Hamas, do that with Hamas is not the answer. Richard. They ruled themselves out, but you could do it with other Palestinians. And what you would do is declare a set of our principles here. If you're willing to sign up to these principles, we will invite you in the door of this political process. And here are some of the things we're willing to offer. Could be more, would be more, depending upon what we can negotiate. And that's the sort of thing you, you could do. It would not be with Hamas, because Hamas, one, is not willing to give up violence, and two, their charter is not willing to coexist peacefully with Israel. That would be one of the things you'd have to sign on to. Anyone who would be invited into this political process would obviously have to accept the right of the Jewish state to exist. Hey, uh, somebody asked on, on the, in the question section about the world. I'm going to make my little bit lighter here. Do, I'm going to listen to you. I'm just moving. Okay. The world, I'm going to actually read this question because I thought it was actually a really good question um, because I've been wondering this as well. It says, uh, the world has doctrines on war and human rights. Why are they not being enforced or endorsed? I mean, uh, you know, we keep hearing about war crimes. I mean, it seems to me at this point, Everyone is committing uh, no. war crimes. No, uh, Hamas, uh, obviously, that's terrorism, the intentional targeting of, uh, of civilians for political purposes. That's the textbook definition of terrorism. No, Israel is not. There's nothing intentional what Israel's doing. One of the reasons they wanted people to leave is they're going, what they would say is they're fulfilling their international obligations by asking civilians to get out of harm's way. But, but Richard, what about the humanitarian crisis? The UN has even talked about, you know, and maybe that's not a war crime. Maybe that's a lesser thing. But they are saying it's a humanitarian crisis, cutting off war, it's, cutting off power, to do water, that. you know, all uh, that. I gather the water's back on. But I think it was at American Urgent. But that kind of a siege, I would think, no, Israel should not be doing that. And whether it's, I'm not a lawyer, whether it's formally inconsistent with international law, whatever, whether it is or not, it's wrong. It seems to me, again, Israel needs to distinguish between Hamas and the people of Gaza. And uh, otherwise, I think it'll run into difficulties with the United States and, and with, with others. It's, look, Israel's a democracy. And I, th I think it's important that its foreign policy be consistent with its values. That is not its value. So I, would actu I actually do not believe that a siege of uh, Gaza is at all appropriate, whether it's legal, illegal, it's just wrong and should not happen. Can you talk, talk, just elaborate on that? Because I think some people don't understand the importance of Israel as the only democratic nation in the region and U.S. security concerns. Can you just thread that needle for us? Because I think that some people don't, don't really understand that Israel has that held a special well. place in, in, for, for Americans ever since its founding, obviously after World War II, after the Holocaust. But Israel, yes, Jew, Israel is a home to Jews. It's special for that reason, obviously. But also, it's, it's a democracy. And as you point out, it's the only tr full, true democracy in, in, in the, uh, in the mi Middle East. And so the United States and Israel have strategic interests that overlap. But I actually think a lot of the American commitment to Israel transcends foreign policy considerations. I think they have a lot to do with Israel coming out of the, 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 a safe place for Jews after the Holocaust and Israel being a democracy. Values are important in foreign policy and not just uh, hard, hard interests. And that's why I think it's important that Israel not can never conduct itself in a way that's inconsistent with those values, because ultimately I think that would have uh, that would affect American uh, support. That would affect American that would reduce American sympathy or identification with with uh israel and in times of war like we've made mistakes ourselves it's always tempting to do things and to cut corners and to do things that are inconsistent with your values you know we had abu Ghraib and things like that in, in, in iraq and we've behaved you know not perfectly at times but i think for israel again it would ju it's just i question it militarily i question it morally but i also think it's it's short-sighted for it to do things like a siege 
in Gaza, because I do think it would jeopardize the, uh, its, its long-term standing here. And I'd say one other thing, and it gets a little bit about why I'm so interested in a political track and a peace process. Ultimately, even though it sounds crazily ideal, given what we're living through. I want there to be a successful peace. I want there to be a Palestinian state, not simply because Palestinians deserve one, but Israel needs one. If Israel is going to continue to be a Jewish and democratic state, it cannot remain in occupation forever of 5 million Palestinians. Uh, either they become citizens, in which case Israel ceases to be a Jewish state, or they don't become citizens, in which case Israel ceases to be a democratic state. So I think Israel needs a, set, a Palestinian state for its own reasons, every bit as much as the Palestinians do. And that's why, again, I'm so intent on going from where we are, as horrific as it has been, into something that has a political process with a chance of succeeding. Are you surprised that a subset of the left has been very vocal uh, in 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 basically talking about the Palestinian cause and that Israel, I mean, I, I think some people, I, I discount those people who don't condemn, condemn what Hamas did to innocent civilians in Israel, but there's also a sure. broader reaction and I'm sure you've seen it among kids, your, you know, your kid's age, my kid's age about sort of the rights of Palestinians and you hear a lot about how they have been oppressed by Jewish policies for for many, many years. And I'm curious to get your reaction to that and what you would say in response to some of these claims about inhumane treatment uh, of the Palestinians I by am, the Israelis. Uh, not totally surprised by it, somewhat surprised, not totally surprised. I am some surprised a bit by the extent of it, uh, by the lack of condemnation of what Hamas did. I could see how you could be sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, how Hamas murdering innocent men, women, and children, shooting babies, how that advances the Palestinian cause. White people are not willing to condemn that. I will not understand. I will not, I will never understand. It is, uh, it's to me, it's just unimaginable. And I just don't understand what could lead otherwise intelligent people uh, to take such, uh, take such a positions. I also think a lot of these people really, shall we say, are selective and lacking in their history. There have been times where Israel has made quite generous offers to Palestinians and they have been rejected by Yasser Arafat and others. So I'm not going to sit here and say Israel's always been perfect. I've been in and out of government. I've criticized Israeli settlement policy. I've just spent a few minutes here criticizing cutting the cutting off of, of water and, and fuel and, and, and so forth. But I would say that when Palestinians have had opportunities historically, they have opportunities now. They won't get everything they want, but they can get a lot of what they want. They could certainly get a hell of a lot more than they have uh, now. And what's clear to me that their agenda is only set back by the kind of horrific violence and terrorism we saw just over uh, a week ago. So again, the, the one-sidedness of these reactions is really discouraging. And I also think it shows a real lack of history. A lot of these schools where it's happening, a lot of these campuses, uh, I, almost, I, I would hope some of the faculty and administration would, would ask themselves, why is it that so many of our students have such an incomplete understanding or picture of what's, of what's going on? And again, I'm not whitewashing it. I'm not saying Israel's always right. I'm not saying the Palestinians are always wrong. But there's a, a complexity to that that I just don't see in the critics. And I just see a morality almost totally lacking in some of the demonstrations that have uh, gone on. The celebration of what happened by certain groups in this country, the celebration, the one-sidedness of their reactions. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it one of... Then again, though, sorry to interrupt, Richard, but then again, if in fact, you know, Israeli officials are calling for wiping out Hamas and yeah. and, and basically leveling Gaza, these, these, these critics see that as genocide well, against the Well, no, again, I see it as different. I, wiping out Hamas seems to me legitimate. This is war, and there's no... 
there's no Israel has every right of self-defense and everything about Hamas says given half a chance they'll do it again so Israel would be derelict Israeli authorities would be derelict if they didn't go after Hamas they should they must that's their obligation the first obligation of a government is to protect the state protect the society so they should again what I think is at issue is what to what extent Israelis go about it in the way that spares as much of the population of Gaza as is is, is possible and there's going to be some trade-offs there I understand that this is you know I'm sitting in a, in a living room it's you know but I you know I've been in those conversations in very when I was in government it's, it's not easy you've got to make some some trade-offs some some calls about what it is you do the Israelis going to have to do that but their intent here is not to go after the population of Gaza their intent is to destroy Hamas the the question is how do you destroy a group that so embeds itself in a population that is the Israeli dilemma right and that was the beginning of our conversation sure. hey can I just ask you two other questions Richard one uh, about Iran you know you talked about a wider war that a, a huge you know a military assault may increase the possibility of Iran's involvement Hezbollah from the north um, how how concerned are you about that and do you believe I know that the intelligence has been kind of back and forth on this at first they said the Wall Street Journal said Iran helped Hamas plan this then they walked then that was walked back there's uh, Joe Biden said on 60 Minutes there's no evidence that they were involved but obviously they I mean maybe it's not obvious but they have supported Ham Hamas with money and all kinds correct. of things so look, correct I would say what we know is and that's not new Iran has had what you might call a structural or strategic relationship with Hamas for decades uh, funding them training them arming them where they can what we what I haven't heard, and I think what the president was getting at, is we don't have intelligence suggesting there was a tactical participation or involvement with this, with what happened uh, eight or nine days ago. And I think that's the distinction. Now, at some point, that distinction may break down, uh, either because we'll get new intelligence that Iran was actually tactically involved. It's a little bit hard to imagine that they could be strategically involved and not tactically involved. I'll be honest with you, it's strange, it's strange credulity. But I think at the moment, the emphasis ought to be on keeping Hezbollah out, not seeing the war widen there, given uh, Hezbollah. Well, it already has, I mean, there has yeah. already been some yeah. skirmishes and, uh, happening there, and a couple of his, yes, I think, yeah, Israeli yeah. soldiers. And, and, but it's died, so far, right? fortunately, rather small scale. And what we want to avoid, obviously Israel desperately wants to avoid, is something large scale, because a lot of civil, you know, Israeli cities and towns would come under, uh, would be, would be uh, vulnerable. But I would think one of the best ways to help keep Hezbollah out of the war is to let Iran know they would be held accountable. And to say that if, if, if they were to get, if, if, if Hezbollah were to attack Israel at scale, that we would look for ways to really hurt Iran, whether it was economically or even militarily. Uh, I would, again, it's these are dangerous uh, paths. I was going to say that's pretty damn scary, and I think that one of the defense ministers on Sunday well, look, threatened this is, America. This look, I mean, this is scary because as awful as it's been, and it has been awful, there is a potential for a war. I think. Look, I only have two rules when it comes to the Middle East. One is that the enemy of your enemy can still be your enemy and the second is that things can get worse before they get even worse and this 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 could get worse mm -hmm. and the way it gets worse is just what you're saying Hezbollah gets in United States then feels compelled to move against Iran uh, it could have all sorts of implications for the world economy oil price prices would would go you know sky high it could get violent. Iran could retaliate in places of its own choosing against the region, against us. So, yeah, I don't want to go down that path. And that's why, again, it's one of the reasons, coming back to where we began the conversation, I'd rather Israel not go in a big way into Gaza, because I think that is a dynamic that increases the odds we could find ourselves in a wider conflict. And again, I don't think anyone's interests, Israel, America's, anybody's would be served by that.
And last question. I mean, I wanted to ask you about the Iran nuclear deal, but we'll do that another time, Richard. We can do that another time. Yeah, but I wanted to ask you about Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, would he, in your view, be receptive? I now there's a unity government to the United States and perhaps other nations kind of urging caution because of the potential for a much wider conflict. And what do you see as uh, his future? Uh, I don't think he would be particularly receptive, but what matters more is what he's hearing from, from his new government and what the mood is in Israel. Uh, look, he's a political si survivor. He's Israel's longest serving prime minister. Uh, he is going to face all sorts of investigations. What we talked about before about the intelligence failure, the defense failure. Uh, not, not to right, mention right. So, corruption charges. But these, that, that those, been, as bad as know, those are, those pale in comparison to this. This is, this is one of the great failures in Israeli history. And the question is, what role did he play in it directly and, and indirectly? Uh, so, and there will be the inquiries and the commissions and the investigations. So whether he can survive that politically, uh, I don't know. He's clearly hoping that how he handles the crisis going forward changes the public perception of him. Because right now, the public perception of him is extraordinarily critical for what happened. So my own view is he is going to try to do what he believes would most, uh, how would I put it, offset the criticism that he's already gotten and he knows he's going to get for, for his part and how things got to here. What that will lead him to do, whether that will lead him to be more cautious, whether that would lead him to be more aggressive, I don't know. But I think that's what's going to affect it, his calculations much more than what President Biden or someone else whispers. Though I will say, I think President Biden right now is by far the most popular person in Israel, far more popular than Bibi Netanyahu. So President Biden actually has a considerable standing in Israel. And if President Biden gets frustrated with Bibi Netanyahu, he has the option of going over his head and speaking directly to the Israeli people. So I think President Biden now has quite a, quite a lot of influence uh, over, how things, uh, how, over how things evolve. You know, before this even happened, Israel was quite divided, had all kinds of obviously protests that were happening, I guess, on a weekly basis against the Netanyahu government. Um, some people are saying they were so focused on domestic issues, setting aside some of the military and security breaches that went on and Hamas's uh, understanding of the weak spots in Israel's security. But, you know, is there a lesson or a warning? I hate to say it, but I think about the U.S. We are so divided. We are so, um, you know, everything is so polarized. The government seems incredibly dysfunctional. And is this kind of something that U.S. leaders need to think about as we are so internally focused, perhaps we need to make sure we're keeping our eye on the ball internationally. I don't know. It, it's something that I, I thought think you're right about to think, when I was reading think about it. this. Many books ago, I wrote a book called Foreign Policy Begins at Home. And I worry about the, uh, the home front if we're distracted and divided. I can't prove it, Katie. But I think one of the reasons Vladimir Putin went into Ukraine in February of last year is because he thought the United States and the West were too distracted and divided to put up a defense. He, he was proven wrong, but I can understand why he may have made the, uh, the calculation. And now we've got the circus going on in Washington with the House of Representatives. And we've just got such a degree of polarization. We can't get funding now through, at least temporarily, for the war in, in Ukraine. This is no way to run a foreign policy. To be a, a great power with allies and partners who depend on you, you you've got to be consistent. You've got to be dependable. You've got to be reliable. And what worries me about what's going on here, it's undermining all of those attributes. So yeah, I think there is an organic connection between our domestic political realities and our ability to be effective in the world. So you're right to, uh, you're right to focus on it. 
Well, Richard, I told you it would be a half an hour, but you spoke with me for nearly an hour, but this was incredibly helpful. You know, I think a lot of people will watch this and, and learn a lot. So I'm really grateful. And I just want to remind people you have a newsletter on Substack Close. Home, and it's home and called away. Home and Abroad. But is that right? You want, you want, home, home and Away. And I'm going to have people Substack sign up and you for it, look, Richard. You put in Richard Haas or Home and Away and it comes up. It's for free. You can afford it. And you just. And then you, you, you click on the subscribe button. Even, even my technological skills allow it. Okay, good. Well, listen, again, thanks so much, Richard. Thank you all for watching. I hope I got to some of your questions. Um, wait, oh, hold on. Oh, can I ask you a couple of quick ones? Because it's not seven o'clock yet. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of quick ones from social media? Is Egypt going to remain safe for American question. travelers? Right now it is mostly. You never know about an isolated incident. And I think if the war widens and there's more pictures on Egyptian television, uh, if the war rather escalates, and there's pictures on Egyptian television of, say, civilian people in Gaza being injured, then I think it increases the chance that there could be demonstrations or violence against outsiders in Egypt. So I would keep an eye on that. Why, why isn't Egypt opening the border for the Palestinians who are trying to flee? I mean, part of it is, Richard, like, Look, where are these people going to go? There's a long history, a complicated history of relations between the Arab countries and Palestinians, and it's not always a happy history. Uh, Palestinians have often, uh, in the case of Jordan, if you remember in September 1970, you had a challenge to the throne. In Egypt, you've had Palestinians and radical groups come in there linking up with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, there's just large populations. A lot of these countries are not welcoming uh, migrants uh, at, at scale, uh, no matter what. So there's a lot of history here. And so I'm not, again, wildly surprised by uh, Egyptians, uh, by Egypt's policy, uh, policy here. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty consistent. It may not be commendable, but it's pretty consistent. And, and finally, is there enough getting done on an action plan to get the hostages? I'm not sure if you're privy to what's happening for the hostages, but given your experience, what are uh, you know, Israeli intelligence agency with the help of, I know, many, many other countries, because a lot of these people have dual citizenship. What do you think is going on behind the scenes well, to try to rescue these people? Are they negotiating? Well, Are they offering What's happening is you know, Gutter or Qatar, if you prefer the pronunciation that way, and others are looking at possible ways of arranging release, prisoner, ex you know, hostage exchange for for prisoners, that's one set of scenarios that I think ultimately some of which will happen. A hostage rescue is extraordinarily difficult, but at some point it may be attempted. But again, you need it, you need incredibly good time sensitive intelligence, and then you need the physical means to carry it out. So I would think the more likely path is through some kind of negotiation and exchange. And also going back to literally where we began the conversation, we have to look at what um, whether at some point Hamas may do something. Maybe it would release some hostages in order to quote unquote generate goodwill. I wouldn't I wouldn't rule that out at at, at some point. I was going to say, could they re could they release some hostages in the hopes that a full out assault from the air and the ground could? could I don't know, be but that's the kind somehow. of thing that. I don't know in order to build international support against certain Israeli actions. That could that happen. On the other hand, they, they, they want the hostages because they think they are a deterrent against certain kinds of Israeli action. Uh, so I think all these things are going to be in play. And again, my heart, look, your, one's heart has to go out to these people. That one minute they're at a, a music festival, a concert, and the next moment they're dragged off or they're, they're in their living room and they're dragged off and suddenly this, this is hell on earth. This is nothing they signed up for, nothing they bargained for, nothing they, they in, in their worst imaginations ever thought would happen to them. And they're not trained for this. These are not, many of these people are not soldiers. And, he, and for the soldiers, it could be worse because they could be treated really, really brutally. So this is, uh, this is unimaginable, but um, so again, yeah, However, it happens. One wants these. We, we you know, one would love the hostage uh, 
dimension of this to end as soon as you know as humanely and as quickly as possible well there does seem to be it does seem to be a glimpse of hope that it's going in that direction from the way we talked this conversation uh, started this conversation with the release of that video of mia and richard engel reporting that they could be released if the circumstances are right or something but um all right, Richard, go have dinner. Okay. I know. I hope you're feeling better. Both of us are sick, everyone. So hopefully, I mean, I love talking to you, Richard. I know yeah. you miss talking to me <laughs> about all these things. So <laughs> thank, thank you so much for your time I, and, and your expertise and your experience. It's, it's really helpful because I think people really are trying to understand this situation and educate them as themselves as best they can. And I'm, I'm trying to do the same for myself all, and, and for my We're all followers. glued to this and we're all trying to figure it out uh, as we as we as we go along. And you know, the stakes are, are enormous and you know, the pressure on people in government to make smart decisions is is, is likewise enormous. But uh, look, thank you for doing this. Uh, this is just this, you know, these conversations I think are good if uh, people are going to get a, a better feel for the, the, what's going on, the choices, the complexity, uh, and there's, there's, there's plenty of complexity. Take care, Richard. Great to see you. Thank Feel you. Better. Thanks, everybody, for watching.